Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you. So I'm going to give you a, a, a quick primer on the Michael J. Fox Foundation, who we are, and uh, kind of reveal to you something that uh, we haven't told anyone yet until now. So uh, I'm really excited to uh, plunge right in. Well, having, everyone's having dinner here. And if I could figure out how to work this clicker, I'd be really happy. OK, here we go. So. Um, we're all about urgency. The Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, you know, the co-founder, Debbie Brooks, she's the former Goldman Sachs executive. And, you know, it's like we're, we're running ourselves like a Wall Street bank. I mean, we're just absolutely um, running on urgency. We're, we're, we're doing tons of transactions every day. And so, you know, we don't have an endowment. 98 cents of every dollar is spent on scientific research at the foundation. So um, uh, they tell us how much money that we're, we're going to project, how much we're going to raise, and we're expected to completely go broke by the end of the year. And so it's a little bit frantic. We never know how much money we're going to get the next year. But uh, it really adds to the fact that you know we're in business to be out of business. And everybody at the foundation has a connection to Parkinson's disease. Uh, you know, we have an active community of Parkinson's disease patients, 500,000. Uh, Forty percent of our staff members have a personal connection. Either one of their family members, uh, their relatives have, have Parkinson's disease. It's very personal to us. Um, you know, 28 uh, board members have a family member with, with PD. And um, our, our 21 uh, people on our advisory panel have, have Parkinson's. And, uh, my story is, um, you know, I, I'm an electrical engineer, computer scientist out of Microsoft. Uh, found myself back into the, the Bay Area a little over 10 years ago. And uh, I got to know the former CEO of Intel. And he just gave me a call one evening out of the blue and said, Ken, I have Parkinson's disease. Can you help me? Uh, and he was diagnosed in 2000, and uh, I'll never forget it. Um, you know, being a high-tech entrepreneur in 2003, getting a call from one of the pillars of Silicon Valley asking for my help is like it's something that I could not uh, could not refuse. So this is how I got into it. There's many stories like myself in the foundation, and so. Just like a, any other business, investment business, venture capitalist, we take a look at the state of the field. We look for the gaps, and then we target our money towards it. It's as simple as that. Um, our sweet spot is between target validation and phase two. That's where most of our money goes to. And um, I know we just feel wide challenges. We try to de-risk the proposition of, 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 for pharmaceuticals to invest in Parkinson's disease. It is our strategy. Um, you know, this is kind of the breakdown. Uh, you know, we, we spend uh, our monies on, on drug development, uh, field-wide challenges, developing preclinical research tools, animal models, looking into biomarkers, which is part of our uh, Parkinson's progression markers initiative, longitudinal clinical trial. Uh, we try to get over these regulatory hurdles and. Uh, we get patients into Parkinson's disease clinical trials as a way to accelerate and get therapies out to the patient population. And then last year, it's like I keep trying to remember people to put data, <laughs> data science into, the, into our slides. You know, uh, we've got 10 PhDs on staff. We're, we're, we are truly experts uh, in, in the field of Parkinson's disease. We have one. Uh, neurologist, 10 business strategies, and me, the data guy. <laughs> they keep forgetting me. So it's so nice to be a part of this community because I have no family professionally. Thank you. Whew. Finally. So, you know, we've got a very active portfolio. We've got four, 450 active grants, and we get nearly a thousand submissions every year and we try to fulfill it we take a look at each one very seriously we bring in experts from the outside 
we, we have experts argue against each other, and at the end of the day, it's us. It's really us who, who makes the decisions on where we should go. Um, and so here are some of our uh, cutting edge uh, results from our investments. We have a company called Aferis, they're out of Austria. Um, they've created antibodies against this protein that aggregates in the brains of Parkinson's disease patients called alpha-synuclein. And we believe that this is the protein that is causing the neurodegeneration of the dopamine neurons that is responsible for motor movement. Uh, Amicus, they are working on a GBA project. Uh, it's another, it's another uh, alpha, alpha synuclein uh, re related strategy, and it's and it's uh, producing not not an antibody, but a, a, a gene uh, therapy approach. MGLUR4. Now, when you see Michael J. Fox and other Parkinson's disease patients, they have this uncontrollable movement. You know. They're waving their arms and they have their head swinging. Uh, this is called dyskinesia. And it's not the disease, it's because they have to take so much of the synthetic dopamine, right? And it spikes. And when it spikes, you, you, you go, you know, you can't control your motor movement. It's the lesser of the evil. You either have to do that or be completely frozen. So, uh, we're coming out with a, a strategy, a drug uh, that uh, will decrease uh, dyskinesia. Today, the only effective treatment for dyskinesia is deep brain stimulation, in which they actually go in and drill a hole in your head and put an electrode and uh, have a pacemaker that's hidden under the skin by your clavicle. And we're trying to make that less invasive for folks. And, uh, there's a company called Civitas. This is an inhalable form of levodopa. So if you can imagine, you know, if you need levodopa to keep moving throughout the day and you go to sleep, you've been without your medication for eight hours, you can't get out of bed, right? So this is the inhaler. So they keep it by their, you know, by their bedside. And when they get up, they could just take a squirt of that and be ample enough to go to the bathroom to take their medication. Uh, and then uh, there's Sanofi. This is something that um, has been pretty uh, near and dear to my heart. This is a, a, a neurotrophic growth factor. It's called GDNF, or no, it's called uh, uh, it's called um, it's a it's akin to a, a glial drive neurotrophic factor. And it's and it in vitro it shows that it makes dopamine neurons fire more often and prevents their death. And uh, this is a gene therapy in which we can program the cells around the dopamine neurons to produce this protein uh, to prevent the, the neurons from dying. Very interesting. I spent uh, a good five years at the University of Wisconsin perfecting uh, the physics of infusion and how to infuse the, 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 uh, the viral vector in the brain. It's a fluid dynamics problem. And uh, this, is, this is one of the reasons I really enjoyed uh, working with Andy Grove uh, in Silicon Valley. I mean, he had the wherewithal. He actually has a PhD from Berkeley uh, in chemical engineering. The, and his, his, it, it turns out his thesis was in uh, fluid dynamics of figuring out the fluid flow of water behind submarine conning towers. And so we went back to his thermodynamics uh, equations and we brought in people from the field of petroleum engineering because they're the only ones who know how to get fluid through porous material, and this time it's the brain. So uh, we, we, we perfected uh, using um, the MRI as a tool for real-time real guidance of uh, thermodynamic properties of the brain in, get, in getting the, the viral vector to where it needs to. So we engage, and we're very active. We have, we have a reach to over a million Parkinson's disease patients uh, across the world. Um, we have uh, our fundraising efforts. We have our clinical trial referral website called Fox, Tri uh, Fox Trial Finder. And then we have uh, a fundraising team that's called Team Fox that uh, 
you know, we have members of our team and, 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 and people who support our foundation that climb mountains, host barbecues, and I myself, I ran the New York Marathon four times uh, in a row to raise money for Parkinson's disease. So now, what we're doing in TransMart is what we're going to talk about next, okay? So I, when I came on board the foundation last year, um, you know, I, we started the wearable sensors project. And, you know, I've been working also with Intel for a number of years with the, their digital health team. And it's been a decade of sensors, really. And Intel is very interested in big data. And so with the help of Andy Grove, we convinced the, the, the executives at Intel to invest in wearable sensors and then the first application should be for Parkinson's disease. We want to put wearable sensors on as many Parkinson's disease patients as possible. Why? Because as I mentioned yesterday, there's a paucity of clinical data on these patients. And there's no objective measure of Parkinson's disease, and we want to change that. And I know we can with the technology that we have today. We're in a very important nexus in our technology. Uh, both on the sensor side and now on the, on the data side. And I told the folks that, uh, you know, my, my new colleagues at the foundation that we're going to take all of the data sets that we could get a hold of, right, and make it open data access. And I didn't know at the time that it was going to be TransMart until, you know, Jay Bergeron came in and, into my life and said, hey, you know, uh, we want to, we, we want to show your, your own data on this platform. We're not going to try to sell you this platform, but you can show it to And I, I thought, like, holy cow, this is, like, really super compelling. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know things about PPMI that I saw, saw on this. So, you know, I said, you know, we got to make, I got to do this, right? You know, like, I basically took the back door. I, I, I told, I asked and pleaded with a sermon at Reuters, can you create a demo instance so I could repeat this demo to the greater pop, you know, my, my, my colleagues at, at Transmart, I mean, at, at Michael J. Fox, and she said, sure. And, and, and this is a list. I literally just copied and pasted the data sets. These are the names of, the, of team members that are going to be responsible within our, within our group to, to, to get and make open you know, to the rest of the, to the, to the world here. And, and this is something that we're really focused on, I'm focused on. And, uh, uh, you know, today Jay said, you know, we could pontificate all day. But, you know, nothing's going to be actually building it and just making it open, you know. Just go ahead and do it, you know. And at the end of the day, when I lose my job, I know I could get a job at Pfizer. <laughs> I'm going to take you up on it today, I swear to God. So listen, I've never announced this before until right now. Because when Jay said, hey, you know, just build it and they'll come, I was so, I was so uh, inspired. I just walked back there. I called my VP. I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to create an RFA. In Q1 of next year, and then we're going to do biomarkers across neurodegenerative diseases. This is going to be like a $1.5 million RFA. We're going to host the data on Transmart, as I said before, right? We're going to work with the Alzheimer's Association, the Mike, uh, our foundation, of course, and the West Garfield Western Foundation in Canada, post the money, and say, guys, uh, this is, this is, this is the RFA. Please apply, um, and um, you know, request RFA to stimulate analysis across Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, PD research to engage further data analysis of existing cohorts, including but not limited to biomarker discovery, standardization of assays, genetic profiles, and imaging modalities. This is what we're going to do. I just decided. This is all I got to say, and thank you very much in my uh, passive-aggressive manner, which is the modality of the Fox Foundation. Thanks in advance for your help.
Cheers. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I think we have to have some questions, definitely. So, uh, here, I'll walk around with the mic here. We got a question over here? Paul? I'm working on neurodevelopment disorders, and so where can we apply to your OFA? No, no, we're going to announce it. We're going to announce it, and uh, Keith is going to help me yep. Yep. from the Transmart end. Yep. Perfect, thanks. Yes. You'll be the first. <laughs> hey, the Imperial College setting of the Transmart 1.2 use exactly the Intel machine learning environment. So we are the same set at all. And uh, Excel will tell you about our setting. We do exactly the same thing. We should collaborate more. OK, go ahead. No, I, I can use all the help I can get, really. Excellent. I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I know Magali was here yesterday, couldn't be here today. But I'll speak for Orion, being an official advisor of Orion. They've already done this for multiple sclerosis, but they'd be happy to work with you and and help out and give you the benefit of their experience as well. Excellent. So excellent. Terrific. Any other questions for, for Ken? Comments? Go ahead. I'm looking oh, Gil. There you are. So I wanted to ask you this. I'm a, a participant in a um, patient study. Not patient, but participant study. The 100 pioneers for what Lee Hood intends to make a 100,000 person wellness study and capture common diseases that emerge over the time of following people who are not ill when they start. Mm -hmm. But one of the little tiny details is an option, since they, they do a whole genome analysis and microbiome and many other things, one of the options they give the participants is to opt out on receiving genotypic information for Alzheimer's and for Parkinson's. And my advice to them was, no way should they be lumping Alzheimer's and Parkinson's together for this purpose, because Parkinson's has much more uh, opportunities for effective treatment and for intervention and so forth than we currently offer for Alzheimer's. Now, from a neurodegeneration mechanistic point of view, I can understand why you lump them together. But from the point of view of patient understanding and patient reaction to risk factors, what is your assessment of how this should be treated? Would you encourage people to know their status with regard to any risk alleles for Parkinson's? You know, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty big question. You know, um, we have a, a, a genetic risk cohort people who have triplication of LRRK2. It's predominantly people from Ashkenazi Jewish descent and Northern Africans that have this gene. And if you have a triplication of this gene, your risk for Parkinson's disease is about 80% by the time you're 65 years old. 85. No, 85%. Okay. Uh, those are the, the statistics, and so, but we need we need that cohort, you see. And so we have uh, a genetic ethicist uh, that's on 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 the call when they ask permission. They inform each participant that's interested in the study about the about these facts. And we completely leave it up to the patients, and we completely, you know, are, are sensitive and honor their, their wishes when it comes to this uh, this knowledge. So that that's how we approach it today. I think this is a really interesting question. So having spent a couple of years working on Huntington's disease, where the penetrance is 100%, um, and where if you have a, a parent with Huntington's disease, your risk is 50%. And if you, you know, the fact is you have that risk, you know it, and you know your risk when your parent gets Huntington's disease. Um, it's really difficult to get people to get tested. 
And the challenge there is one of the treatment, which is, you know, with Huntington's, there is no treatment. With Parkinson's, you have some treatments, but they're certainly not, not very efficacious. But the challenge, I think, with a lot of these genetic diseases, when you have that risk factor, is if there's no treatment, there's really no benefit to being tested. Um, I was speaking with a, a, the mother of two young children uh, at this Huntington's Disease Society of America meeting in Seattle. And um, her kids were, were you know, seven and five. And her husband had just died of Huntington's disease. And she said that she wasn't going to get her children tested until she could obtain for them lifelong health insurance. Because if she got them tested and they were gene positive, they were uninsurable. So these are some of the real challenges, I think, in these diseases. One of the other things I think is really interesting to point out about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, you know, to your point, Gil, is when we look at these from a Transmar perspective, right, is genotype makes a big difference. You know, in, in Parkinson's, there are five, five genes that are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion that increase your risk for developing disease. In Alzheimer's, there's at least three. You know, are these the same disease? You know? That's a thing. I mean, I don't think they are. I, mean, I don't I think, think so either. I, think there's like, <laughs> I mean, there's probably, probably eight different phenotypes within PD that I could think of. Yep. Yeah. So um, Keith and I were at a, an Orion Bio Networks um, on fluid biomarkers, right? Um, and they, they, I remember that guy who got up and he said so many people are, are wrongly diagnosed over an eight-year period that have come to them and say that they've got Parkinson's and they've got Alzheimer's and they don't really have it. So I think a lot of that's going on as well at the moment and we don't have good testing for it. I think that's one of the real opportunities for the transplant thing is because we don't have an oncology or clinical care that is market-based, we have this observational oncology. Yeah. Well, and the, the challenge with this is that when we, when we can bring the genomic information together with the clinical information, we can use the genetics to determine that cohort. So you can take your Parkinson's disease and find all your, you know, Park 7 mutants and take those as a cohort and compare them to the rest of your population. Right. So it enables the kind of, of genetic stratification of your population, even if you don't have the clinical data to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great. Yeah, thank you. Ken, thanks very much for coming. This is uh, wonderful. Michael and I went to the Faster Cures, and Kevin went to the Faster Cures meeting a couple years ago and presented, and there was a lot of interest, you know, in the Milken Foundation. Ben, we'd like to talk with you about that. I think we were a little early, but I think we can go back. Okay. My question is, you've been here for a couple of days now, and you've gotten to know us a little bit, and, you right. know, we had some phone calls earlier. You know, in terms of what you're seeing here and the energy and, you know, kind of the diversity of the team, what advice would you give us in terms of, you know, in, you know, joining the community as we're just growing? You know, what advice would you give us as being part of a team that's growing that can, you know, help us understand what the next couple of years is going to look like in this adventure because it is an adventure that we're embarking on together? I know. I, I, I you know, I... I so now I'm, I'm kind of drawing on my uh, former life as a software entrepreneur and, and actually, a, you know, an executive of one of the largest software companies in the world. You know, we need to build alliances everywhere. Uh -huh. Really, like um, uh, I was a I was a director of IT Pro Marketing at Microsoft, and our strategy back then was, look, you know, we created a solution with the software end to end. Guys, create a solution end to end with your software, right? And 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 with your partners, you know, the people who create the additional uh, value add functions, right? And and you know, work with Jay, work with folks at Takeda, because I think those are the are, are kind of the enter our enterprise customers. And see what their needs are from end to end. Don't offer them just these. Little, little applications, figure out holistically what the end-to-end -end solution is going to be, right? And then work with people like Amazon Web Services to package that solution. So you have, you know, pharmaceutical R&D in a box, right? And that's what you need to do. I, I think that is the strategy that we, you know, if I were, if I were, uh, kind of sitting in your seats at the Transmart Foundation, running it, 
those are those are some of the strategies that would come to my mind. I think those are sage words of advice. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very so, much, everyone. Thanks. Ken.